Good afternoon. My name is John Miller. I'm the Executive Director here for the Shippensburg Historical Society. And today we're going to do a, con a condensed version of one of my educational programs called Picture This. And this is where you use a series of documents or photographs, maybe art or sculpture, in order to tell a story about the past. And today we're going to talk a little bit about the role of the African American soldier during the Civil War. This presentation or this educational program is geared more toward high school aged kids. We can accommodate up to about 20 um, per group. The program itself lasts for about an hour and we have worksheets that we can issue to each of the students and we also have bios so if you would go down to Locust Grove Cemetery any of the U.S. colored troops that served during the Civil War we have a photograph of the tombstone and an updated bio on the back that would basically be read aloud to tell the entire group the story of this individual here. The role of the African American during the Civil War is kind of unique, but in order to tell you about that, we kind of have to examine a series of events that took place a century prior to the American Civil War. Now, during the French and Indian War, we do know that some African Americans played a role uh, serving as Teamsters to the provincial armies, but we know more about the African American serving almost on the eve of the American Revolution in places like the Battle of Bunker Hill. If you're looking for an interesting story, look up the First Rhode Island Infantry. They were an all African American regiment who served throughout the entire Revolutionary War. African Americans did play a major role during the Siege of Yorktown and they helped pretty much force to gain our independence from England. Now, at the end of the American Revolution, a lot of states began creating legislation banning or prohibiting black men of color who were free or slave from serving into the militias. 1792, the United States Congress also enacted a very similar legislation, basically saying only white, able men were allowed to serve in the military. During the War of 1812, we know that a lot of African Americans served primarily with the naval forces of the United States, as well as serving within the British ranks of the military. And during the War of 1812, we do know that England did try to recruit African American men that were enslaved, offering them their freedom once this war was over. Here we have Charles Ball, which is a great story if you want to get on the internet. But basically, he was an enslaved individual, and then he became declared free. He declared himself as a free and independent person. Now, he had two options during the War of 1812. He could obviously serve with the U.S. Navy, or he could go ahead and serve with the British military. So he went ahead and decided to serve with the U.S. Navy. Leading into the years of the American Civil War, um, there's a lot of question. Um, with the institution of slavery, you have the Underground Railroad, uh, especially that comes through here in the Cumberland Valley from Chambersburg through Shippensburg to Carlisle. But when the Civil War began, it was more about the preservation of the Union. And during the early years of the American Civil War, President Abraham Lincoln as well as the United States Congress did pass a series of laws. The Confiscation Act of 1861 basically authorized the confiscation of Confederate property by Union forces. Property also included slaves. Then you had the Militia Act of 1862, which was legislation that would allow African Americans to serve in the Union Army, more or less behind the scenes. Now, some states went ahead and took that as a legal way to recruit African Americans to serve as part of the state militia. Kansas, South Carolina, as well as Louisiana began recruiting African American men as early as 1862, and they would actually see combat in late 1862. By July of 1862, Congress passed the Second Confiscation Act. This basically gave Lincoln the powers to use contraband or confiscated property, such as slaves, 
in a way that would be useful to the Union Army. But he did not want to, basically, he didn't want to conflict with the border states, so he never used this power. But the Confiscation Act, or the second one, does kind of give pathway to an Emancipation Proclamation, which Lincoln wrote the preliminary one on September 22nd, 1862, after the Maryland Campaign. And what this preliminary Emancipation Proclamation does, it basically tells the South, you have until January 1st of 1863 to quit this rebellion, or if you don't, your slaves are going to be considered free. And of course we know the outcome of that because the Civil War continues until 1865. Now, a series of things did happen in 1863, such as the United States War Department issuing General Orders Number 143 on May 22nd. This establishes a Bureau of Colored Troops. This would become known as the United States Colored Troops. While this program was being kicked off, the state of Massachusetts had already been recruiting men to serve within their state, primarily in the 54th, followed by the 55th Massachusetts. And these men would see action in June and July of 1863. And because of the 54th and 55th Massachusetts, and because of the establishment of the United States Colored Troops, a large contingency of African Americans living in Franklin County, as well as in Cumberland County, began listing into the military because now, rather than serving with the wagon trains, they can be used in any capacity as deemed necessary by the U.S. government, including serving as infantry. So now that we got the history part of it, let's look at some of the sculptures, photographs, and artwork um, that kind of tell a story about the African American during the Civil War. So as you can see, we have a very beautiful monument here. This is located in Boston, Massachusetts. It's the Robert Gould Shaw Memorial. Colonel Robert Gould Shaw was in command of the 54th Massachusetts. He was killed in July of 1863, leading his regiment on the assault of Battery Wagner outside of Charleston, South Carolina. The monument here was actually dedicated in 1897. So, one of the questions I would ask the students is, what is your first impression about this sculpture and what seems to be happening? So, given a couple minutes to observe this and photograph, some of the answers should be coming up would be the fact that the men are marching forward, they're heavily armed, well equipped, and uniformed. But if you notice above here, right above a brave commander, you have Lady Liberty. And if you look carefully at what she's holding, she is holding an olive branch, which traditionally means it's a symbol of peace. So this monument here really does tell an excellent story about how proud these men were to be fighting finally in the Civil War to gain not freedom for themselves, but freedom for all African American men who were enslaved, as well as to be granted the rights that every citizen in the United States at the time had. Now using a photograph, this is a very good example of the average African American family. So one of the questions I would ask is, what is, this, what is your first impression about this photograph? And as you can tell, it is a family of a Civil War soldier. The uniform would be a dead giveaway. How would you describe the people, their age, clothing, expressions? Well, we do know that this is, again, an average family from the Civil War. The parents are most likely in their 30s. The daughters are probably about 12 years of age or younger. And the expressions, if you look at the soldier, he does have the expression of being proud. But the one little girl that's on his knee, you can see there in her eyes, there's a little sadness. Maybe a little fear and sadness and worriedness in his wife's eyes as well as in his other daughter's eyes. So you've heard the term, a photograph is worth a thousand words. The same would apply to this as well. 
Why do you think the photo was taken, or what's the message behind the photograph? Well, obviously it was a keepsake. Of course, photography has been around for about 20 years prior to the American Civil War, and even though it's a relatively new invention, a lot of people were taking advantage of that technology. So the photograph would have been struck as a keepsake. When the photograph was taken, was there a message behind it? Definitely not. However, in today's standards, there is a message behind this photograph, and that's because it depicts the hardships that each family would have went through worrying about their loved ones out on the battlefield. As we know, a lot of fathers, sons, family members who went to war never made it back home. And last but not least, had any of these objects in the photograph survived the end of the Civil War? Maybe not necessarily with what these folks are wearing, but some of the objects that would have been worn during the period have survived the war because of the fact that we see them in museums. Now we're going to study some of the artwork of the flags for some of these regiments with the, 20, uh, with the U.S. Colored Troops, starting with the 24th Regiment. And as you can see, there's a gentleman there on the rock. He's reaching toward the sky. And every flag has a motto on top. And of course, the flag on, the motto on top here says, Let soldiers in war be citizens in peace. So what is the interpretation of this flag? Well, the rights guaranteed by the government would presumably come with citizenship for African Americans after the war. The paper that the soldier is reaching for is Latin. And it basically says, Fiat Justicus, which is Latin for let justice be done. And you can also see two other soldiers in the distance of this photograph doing the same thing. Now this one here has a much heavier story behind it. This is with the 22nd Regiment of U.S. Colored Troops. And on top of the flag, you'll notice the Virginia State Seal, which is 6 Semper Tyrannus, which means um, thus always the tyrants, or death to tyrants. And what that basically boils down to in today's terms is that a tyrant always meets a dire end, which is just and should be expected. Now, if you notice, you have a soldier of blue, African-American, running a bayonet through a Confederate soldier. If you notice, he is holding a white flag. In the background, which you probably won't be able to see with this video when I upload it, you see African-Americans firing into what appears to be Confederate soldiers that are all their aid prisoners, or they were surrendering. What that depicts is the fact that the image could be a sign of no mercy. As we know, the image could actually be in response to some of the atrocities committed by the Confederate soldiers at places like Fort Pillow on April 12, 1864, when African American soldiers were not taken in as prisoners, but instead they were all shot. So they call it the Fort Pillow Massacre. The 127th Regiment of U.S. Colored Troops Top of their flag reads, we'll prove ourselves as men. So the phrase most likely means that they want to prove themselves brave and worthy soldiers fighting next to their white counterparts. As you can see, the soldier is basically welcoming Lady Columbia, and he is proud to be taking the American flag from her. This one here is for the 3rd U.S. Colored Troops. It reads, rather die free men than live to be slaves which translates into, it's better to take a chance of fighting for freedom rather than doing nothing at all as a slave. And if you notice, he is proudly gripping the American flag as he is taking it away from Lady Columbia. That's because he is ready for the opportunity that has presented itself, and he wants to prove himself as equal to the white soldiers. Learning through newspapers, this is real interesting because newspapers all have drawings as well as commentary. This one here is a little politically charged. And we're not going to read anything, but this basically deals with a raid that took place in North Carolina. And because of the Confiscation Act, you actually see U.S. colored troops that are on a plantation confiscating everything that the plantation owner has, including their slaves. So 
So you can see celebrations taking place. You can see a black man here thanking his, uh, the white officers for the, the rescue. But what I find interesting is the plantation owner himself, he has been placed under arrest. So again, a photograph, or in this case an etching, is definitely worth a thousand words. Newspapers had broad posters posted in them, as well as around different towns. I love the broad posters because of the fact that there's a lot of information you can take out of this. First, men of color to arms, now or never, in small parentheses, this is your golden moment. Here we have a $100 bounty plus pay, $13 a month, as well as state 82 families. So their families would be taken care of while they're fighting a war. Here we have a poster that's asking for non-commissioned officers and clerks. Pays a lot more, $18 to $26 per month. But you still have the local and government bounties to go with it. And last but not least, to colored men, freedom, protection, pay, and a call to military duty. This is the time to do something about it, now or never. And I love the political cartoon here because it shows an escaped slave as he appeared once he got to the north. And here he is, dressed as a, as a U.S. colored church soldier who's going back down into the south fighting the war. So there's a lot of material behind all of this. There was an estimate of about 200,000 African American soldiers who served in the Civil War, with 37,000 of them being killed. 21 year old Samuel Cable, he enlisted in the 55th Massachusetts. Now, I'm not going to read this entire letter, but I just want to point out some areas because there is a lot of emotion when you read through this. And unfortunately, we just don't have a lot of time when you record. But one of the things I wanted to point out is that he's looking for his wife, or he's sending a letter to his wife. He wants to know that she's still in slavery, and it won't be long until we have crushed the system that now opposes you in the course of three months. We will be at liberty. So you can tell he's very optimistic about this war ending quickly. At the same time, he is saying about how there's a great outpouring of colored people with now rallying with hearts of lies against the very curse that has separated you and me. And then from there, he, there goes into some of the sadness that he can't wait until the day he can actually see her as well as the rest of the family again. So this letter is very rare, um, particularly for him to be sending it to his wife who was enslaved because if she would get caught with this, she would be severely punished. But then you have political drawings at the end of the war because now African Americans have won their independence. They're no longer in slavery. However, they weren't guaranteed some of the same rights. And the right to vote was one of them at first. So you have Liberty and Lady who's asking herself, shall I trust these men who are ex confederate officers and not this man here? So the term pardon and franchise comes up. We have to look at these definitions as they would have been applied 150 years ago and not by today's standards. So pardon and franchise would be basically a franchise as a privilege of public nature conferred on an individual or a group by the government. In this case, the African American soldier was not given the right to vote. However, a pardon is a government decision that allows a person who has been convicted of a crime to be free of that conviction as it never happened. And of course, this image, as far as what was it to bring, this was made to make the American public think. What is the right thing to do? Do we forgive the South for their sins? Obviously, we want to put everything back together and move forward. But you can't do that without guaranteeing the rights for everybody. Last but not least, you heard me talk about the research triangle. So everything that was in this PowerPoint basically goes back with 
textual documentation, photographic evidence, and surviving examples. Whether you are writing an article, or you're part of a documentary, or you're putting a program, or it doesn't matter what you're doing, as long as you have that research triangle there, that information, that triangle will definitely help you out. And last but not least, once we are allowed to roam the streets again without being quarantined, I would go ahead and recommend you check out Locust Grove Cemetery, go to Chambersburg or to Mercersburg, and learn the stories about some of these men who served in the U.S. Colored Troops. Until then, I want to say thank you for watching, thank you for supporting us during these difficult times, and until next time, stay safe.